Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Uh, it is the start of 2022. It is our first show of 2022 and it is almost exactly one year from our very first show ever, which was on January 6th of 2021. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, happy anniversary to the stream. Hi, Simsilica. Hi, Puddle Glum. Hi, Key Squared. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, I do, um, before we get started, I just want to read, as I typically do, the um, land acknowledgement and labor acknowledgement from the university. Uh, since this show is done for Virginia Tech University Libraries, um, and we broadcast from the special collections in university archives here, um, uh, going out to two different channels, the twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios channel, which is the library's channel, as well as my own channel, uh, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, so since this is a university event, I like to read the acknowledgements so that we keep them in mind and uh, pay attention to what the university is saying that it's going to be doing. Um, so I'm just gonna read those real quick. <laughs> also, thank you, Key Squared, for the happy anniversary. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, meaningful, er, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So those are the official uh, land and labor acknowledgements from Virginia Tech, and I do think that it is important to pay attention to them and to read them at the beginning of each stream. Anyway, welcome uh, to Archival Adventures. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And um, today, in honor of our anniversary stream, um, our very first stream went live one year ago, um, only on the VTUL Studios channel. Um, and I looked at our pulp science fiction collection, just generally. I just pulled a bunch of random stuff and we looked at it. In honor of that, and as a nod to that, I decided today to do a more focused look at our pulp science fiction collection, and I pulled our publications from Australian pulp science fiction publishers, or th these, are, these are, are our Australian imprints. So we have American, British, and Australian imprints for pulp science fiction, and I, um, thought it would be good to take a look at the Aussie ones and see what's there, see what we can learn about them. And uh, I may, I think at least one of these is old enough that I could read a story from it. So if we've got time, we'll do that. Also, uh, it looks like we are getting raided by 16-bit Eric. Um, Eric, thank you for bringing the whimsies over. Welcome everybody in. Um, also, hi Fluidan. Um, hi, just here for coffee. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Lord Portico. Thank you for uh, being a wonderful, wonderful mod. Uh, Geek Outs, hello. Uh, hi, Hannah and Rykar. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the one-year anniversary of Archival Adventures. Um, <laughs> so uh, as I was just telling everybody, I don't know how much you all heard as you were coming in. Um, it, it has been one year since I first went live with this program on Wednesdays. And uh, one year ago, on January 6th, we were looking at pulp science fiction. Um, and so today, we're looking at pulp science fiction again. This time, we are looking specifically at Australian pulp science fiction. Uh, so it should be a good time. I've got a box here of some pulp sci-fi magazines. We're going to take a look. We're going to find out what we can about these uh, publications. Um, 
If you aren't familiar with the term pulp sci-fi, you may be familiar with uh, science fiction magazines. A couple of them are still around, like uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, you may have heard of Asimov's science fiction or analog science fiction. Um, these all got their start as pulp sci-fi. Pulp is a term that generally just means um, that these were uh, printed on basically pulp stock. They were printed on really poor quality paper. They were not intended to last. Um, and a lot of major science fiction or speculative fiction authors got their start publishing short, publishing short stories in pulp sci-fi uh, publications. So our collection includes both, uh, or includes American, British, and Australian pulp sci-fi. Not very much Australian, but we're gonna spend two hours today looking at that specifically. Ooh, Be Right UK, thank you for the 500 bits. <laughs> and Eagle Sight, thank you for the happy one year anniversary. Um, yeah, the Rogan 27 channel has been streaming for a year now, and I'll have an anniversary announcement for that channel coming up at some point. I don't know exactly when I'm going to be doing an anniversary stream there. Um, V2L Studios has been live for more than a year. I think we first went live in October of 2020. Um, and I don't know if we're going to do anything particularly special as a celebration of that. Um, I have not heard any discussion of that. but. Welcome in, everybody. It's great to have you here. And again, Eric, thank you so much for bringing the Whimsies by. It is always great to have you join the stream um, on Wednesdays, and I do appreciate it very, very much. Um, so how about I pull out our first magazine here, and let's see what we got. Um, also, I have... There's a light like right behind the camera. And so every time I'm looking at you, I'm also going um, light blind. Uh, like, so if, if I'm a little distracted after I look at you, uh, it's because I then can't see anything. Um, it's okay though. It's just a change from how the setup has been in the past. Um, and honestly, not something I'm d unused to. Uh, I did theater. Um, all right, let me go ahead and switch this over to, um, the document view so we can look at what we're looking at. Also, um, I usually do like some chill piano in the background for the stream because we're doing pulp sci-fi, uh, or, uh, yeah, pulp sci-fi. I, I thought it would be good to do, um, some synthwave instead. If the music gets distracting or too much or it's too loud, do let me know and I can make adjustments. Yes, the first one that we are looking at is Void. Um, and so let me, <laughs> I have like two computers and an iPad to run the stream and now I have another iPad tablet device, another tablet device uh, to try and look up some information on to tell you all about what we're looking at. Um, oh, too many things open here. Uh, first, I want to go to, yeah, come on, are you going to give me a keyboard? Thank you. Show keyboard. Um, So first I want to give you a little bit of background. <laughs> Unbranded wireless tablet device, indeed. Um, I mean, I'm an educational institution. I don't mind letting you know that we have iPads that we use for uh, the work that we do here. Um, I'm also using an Apple computer and a, and a uh, Windows laptop. Um, and we're using something called um, a Pearl 2. Uh, that actually powers our stream. That is the, the main piece of technology that allows me to uh, send the signal out um, <coughs> from the two computers, because I have... <laughs> What's not worth it? I, what are you sorry about? Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, the Pearl 2 is the, the main piece of technology that we're using to, to run our stream here in in the building here. Um, things here are a little bit more complicated than um, 
like a personal streaming setup. Like for my personal channel, when I'm doing gaming streams at home, that's all a single computer setup. It's very simple. This is much more complex here uh, in sort of a more like studio focused space um, and provides its own challenges, I will say. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. We're looking at Pulp Sci-Fi. Um, I'm going to just give a little bit of information first about our general collection of... Um, doo -doo -doo. Here we go. Uh, so our pulp sci-fi is all part of the William J. Heron Speculative Fiction Collection. Um, and the basic description of that collection, which is basically all I know about it, because it's not one of our main focus areas. Um, so we don't honestly do a whole lot with it. Um, but between 1989 and 1994, Special Collections and University Archives acquired a significant collection of science fiction materials from William J. Heron, a private collector from North Carolina. There are more than 150 science fiction reference works, 11,000 paperback novels, and 4,500 issues from over 200 titles of British, Australian, and primary, primarily American pulp magazines dating from the 1910s through the 1980s. These include the first public published works of well-known science fiction and fantasy authors. So that is just some general information about the overall collection that these are a part of. Um, and I will look up um, just some information about Void Magazine so that we can learn about it. Um, ooh. <laughs> Thank you, Soybot. Um, now you're imagining if any of the pulp writers could ever have imagined how their work would be discussed. Hand size recording and broadcasting devices with the signal arriving on other similar sized devices. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I imagine some of them had ideas of, of technologies similar to ours. Um, let's see. Let's, I want to go to, I'm trying to remember it. Of. All right, so the place that I am going to be going uh, to get general information about the magazine or any authors that we're going to come across, the main source I'm going to be using for sort of researching what we're looking at today is the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction or the Science Fiction Encyclopedia. Um, it is sf-encyclopedia.com and it is a good online encyclopedia or online reference source for um, information about science fiction. Uh, so let me look up Void. And it's one that is actually a free resource. Um, so like our library listed in our databases, just like we do all of our subscription databases, but it is just a free website. Uh, and you're welcome to go and uh, visit it whenever you want. So Void Science Fiction and Fantasy. It's an Australian digest sized saddle stapled semi prozine. Uh, it issued five issues from 1975 to 1977, thereafter continuing until 1981 as a series, four books, three numbers per book, which effectively constituted an original anthology series published by Void Publications, Melbourne. <clears throat> Edited by Paul Collins, at a time when Australian science fiction had few local outlets, Void was a brave venture, though in appearance it could be described in its first incarnation as an amateur magazine, with an overcrowded layout on cheap paper, it contained some original and reprint work from the U.S., but was primarily a platform for such Australian science fiction writers as A. Bertram Chandler, David J. Lake, and Jack Wodums. Void was dated by year only, and only one issue, number two, was numbered. Numbers six through eight were published in book form as an original anthology, uh, Envisaged Worlds, Anthology 1977, Numbers 9 through 11 as Other Worlds, Anthology 1978, 12 through 14 as Alien Worlds, uh, 15 through 17 as Distant Worlds, and a further anthology, Frontier Worlds, was offered to subscribers in lieu of number 18. 
<clears throat> so that's an interesting and complex history there. But um, so it's a semi-pro zine, um, which would be semi-professional. Semi um, digest size just is referring to the actual size of the book itself, um, which is slightly larger than a paperback novel or like a, a pocket book type paperback novel. Um, this appears to have been priced at one Australian dollar. Um, let me see, I don't know if it's in focus. There we go. Um, so yeah, Void just seems like a good name for a sci-fi magazine. However, <laughs> whoever came up with it uh, had a good, good idea. I would agree, Void is a, a great name for a science fiction magazine. Uh, so let's, let's take a look inside and see what we find. <clears throat> Ooh, announcing the science fiction exposition. Attend the greatest science fiction event ever. SF Expo 76. Visit the future with Forrest J. Ack Ackerman, Isaac Asimov, Jim Bain, Ben Bova, Lee Brackett, R. Bretner, John Brunner, Lynn Carter, A. Bertram Chandler, Hal Clement, Theodore Cogswell, L. Sprague de Comp, Gordon Dixon, Frank Kelly Fries, Raymond Z. Gallen, Horace L. Gold. Hopefully you're recognizing some of these names because some of these are big names. Uh, C. L. Grant, James Gunn, Joe Haldeman, Edmund Hamilton, Harry Harrison, Lawrence M. Janifer, Jacqueline Lichtenberg, Sam Lundwall, Catherine McLean, uh, Barry Maltzberg, Thomas F. Montaloni, Dan Morgan, Fe Frederick Pohl, J.E. Pornell, Mac Reynolds, Fred Saberhagen, Bob Shaw, Robert Sheckley, George O. Smith, Norman Spinrad, Brian M. Stableford, Christopher uh, Stashif, Mort Weisinger, Jack Williamson, Gahan William, uh, sorry, Gahan Wilson, and Roger Zelazny. There are quite a few really big names in there. That's a amazing crowd. Um, honestly, the paper does not feel that cheap. It feels like typical old um, magazine paper, but it could just be like these. This is from the seventies, <clears throat> and this this kind of paper, if it was like. 30 years older than it is would probably be a lot more brittle and a lot yellower and so I mean it is cheap paper this is you can tell not acid free like it's 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 cheaper paper it's yellowing over time it'll it'll get crumbly at some point but it's in really good condition uh, which could just be the fact that it's been in an archives type space for a long time um, so it is cheaper paper, but it doesn't feel like super, super cheap to me. <clears throat> oh, I'm not, I, I will look. Um, so these authors will be speaking about the future of science fiction slash fact, um, which incidentally, science fiction slash fact uh, is the title of another pulp publication. Um, Meet with them for talks, discussion groups, and rap sessions. <laughs> 70s terminology there. There will be exhibits and displays by organizations involved in solar energy, ecology, space technology, urban planning, and the arts. Over 100 science fiction and fantasy films will be shown in a five-day round-the-clock screening. Also, mini film festivals featuring the films of Ray Harryhausen, giant insects, killer plants, and the films of Jack Arnold. The film program covers almost 75 years of science fiction and fantasy film production from uh, Melies to the newest years of science fiction and, fi or sorry, to the newest releases. There will be film guests, discussions, a special exhibit of original film props and memorabilia from Gort to Bela Lugosi's Dracula Cape. There will be authors, autograph booths, and publishers displays where you can check out the latest books in the science fiction field. Uh, <clears throat> still haven't seen where it's happening, but we'll get there. There will be science fiction dealers in books, film materials, art, and collectibles. All this will be taking place at the New York Hilton. Science Fiction Expo will occupy the two entire convention floors, equal in ground space to a full city block. 
containing three theaters, nine lecture and display halls, and four exhibition halls, all of which will be traveling in the future from June 25th to 29th, 1976. Attending registration was $18.50 plus $1.48 in New York sales tax. <clears throat> And all members received two pre-expo publications, the program book and package and the post-expo souvenir book. I want to go too, Puddle. It sounds like an amazing convention. Uh, somebody invent time travel so I can back, go back to 1976 um, to attend this science fiction expo, please. Uh, a few of those authors did more factual slash academic work. The first book you read by Ben Bova was a discussion of the nature of quasars and you loved it so much uh, you grabbed it when the school was disposing of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of these authors are more fantastical science fiction or fantastical uh, storytelling, and some of them are very hard science. And a lot of, honestly, a lot of hard science uh, speculative fiction authors have a background in the actual sciences. Um, like, a lot of them have done actual, like, scientific research and publication um, and then get inspired to tell stories. Or have been inspired to tell stories and uh, <clears throat> that led them into the sciences. There, there's many routes, but a lot of the, the more detailed, accurate, hard sci-fi sort of um, stories come from authors that actually know how to do scientific research and are able to base their storytelling in actual scientific theory that is uh, current at the time. <clears throat> so um, as noted in the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, the editor is Paul Collins. Let's see, we have Out of the Vault by Theater Butler. Uh, Standing Ovation in a Field of Flowers by John Cooper. Squaw Man by Jack Wodums. The Cosmic Boo Boo by Scott Edelstein. The Jekyll and Hyde Mushrooms by N.G. Tucky. Gorley's Greenhouse by Jeffrey James. If anybody is interested in one of these stories, uh, do pop it, pop it in the chat, let me know. I can take a, a closer look at, at them. Um, these are too new for me to be able to really read the entire story on, um, on the stream, but we can look at who the author is, maybe what else they might have published, and maybe look at kind of the topic of the story. Uh, the Veiled Pool of Misterac by Daryl Schweitzer. Kelly Country by A. Bertram Chandler. Deja Vu by Peter Ford. And Trial by Storm by Chris Lampton and Dave Bischoff. And introducing Captain Sparks, the hero. He means, well, he means well anyway. Uh, Stray the Faithful Dog, whose function is to be seen and not heard. Prof? I'm not sure who, which of these is which. His patience is a virtue, but often spells doom. Teats, she's gorgeous, voluptuous, and what's more, she's all woman. So 1970s uh, sexism there. Thanks. Uh, Sorcy, craftier than a fox, and well, let's just say he's all for himself. I'm guessing that's Sorcy. The Chromites. They're always in for a surprise, but hell, they always turn the tables. I'm guessing this is one of the chromites here. I think this is Prof, and this must be Captain Sparks. The Moby, savior of our hero, rescuer of the defenseless. If only it worked as good as it sounded. Yeah, Portico. Good grief indeed. Oh! Key Squared, you just saw Daryl Schweitzer at a con a few months ago. He's still at it. I mean, the 70s weren't that long ago. Uh, so not surprising that some of these people are still around and actively doing it, but that's pretty cool. Sorcery looks very like a certain Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah, actually, that illustration does sort of look like um, uh, Doctor Strange, indeed. Keep your eyes open for these characters. You'll be seeing a lot of them. 
Copyright 1976 by Paul Collins. Hmm. Out of the vault. This is interesting. So I'm it's out of the vault, the planet, how I was induced to leave the Earth and become one. Explorations of early science fiction fantasy, researched by Theodore Butler. I have no idea who authored this quaint and sometimes hilarious account of the end of the world in the year 2076. It was published originally in Knickerbockers Magazine for July 1853 and found by me in a pile of old magazines in an antique shop in Owl's Head, Maine. Knickerbockers was one of the leading American literary periodicals of the first half of the 19th, 19th century. It was published in New York and held a position in publishing then similar to that of the New Yorker today. Its contents were controlled by a clique of writers uh, with whom Edgar Allan Poe had had a celebrated feud a decade earlier, and perhaps to conceal this fact they seldom signed their work. As a result, one of the earliest American science fiction humorists has slipped into total obscurity. The planet is interesting for its tongue-in-cheek predictions of future life which mostly seem like 19th century plus a few balloons. Its political comments foretelling the American Civil War, the passages which seem to parody Mary Shelley's The Last Man, and its satire directed at the Millerites, a fan uh, fanatical religious cult of the day. <clears throat> the Millerites were the followers of one William Miller, a War of 1812 veteran who calculated from the Bible, mostly Daniel and Revelations, that the world would end sometime in the fall of 1843. The second coming would take place, the city of God lowered from the skies like a celestial freight elevator, and the faithful would be taken on to their rewards. Of course, in order to be faithful, you had to be a Millerite. A major tenet of the faith was that since the world was about to end, one should do no work, sell all property, and prepare for judgment. Some took this to such extremes that they didn't bother to indulge in such earth earthly things as eating, and subsequently starved to death. It all went well enough until the selected date came and passed and the Lord failed to show up. Miller managed to recover his prestige somewhat by announcing that he had made a mistake. He had made his calculations by the standard Arabic numerals rather than Hebrew ones. And the real date for Doomsday was October 22nd, 1844. Incredibly, he got an even stronger following this time and the result was national hysteria. <clears throat> Whole towns ab abandoned worldly pursuits, fortunes were given away and uh, property abandoned. As the night approached, people bought white ascension robes, alluded to in the story, and sat on rooftops awaiting the coming of the angels. At least one man murdered his wife because she refused to believe in the cult. To add to the dramatic effects, as midnight approached on the 22nd, a spectacular thunderstorm broke out all along the eastern seaboard of the U.S., and it really seemed that the heavens would be rent asunder. At the exact moment of midnight, many of the faithful cast themselves or cast themselves from housetops and church steeples, assuming that they would be snatched from death by St. Michael and his winged troops right before they hit the pavement. Uh, they weren't. And to the considerable embarrassment of Mr. Miller, October the 23rd arrived on schedule. Unable to live this one down, Miller renounced his more radical teachings and went west to spread the gospel to the um, indigenous people who hadn't the good sense to scalp him. He died in obscurity, now a country... Uh, he died in obscurity, now a county seat in Wyoming, uh, in 1849. The cult later gave up the naming of specific dates and evolved into a somewhat more respectable Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> Schweitzer writes a lot of science fiction bibliography and biography as well as fiction these days. That is really cool, Key Squared. So, this is a reprinting here of an item from Knickerbockers in 1853. But it's, the byline on it is Theodore Butler, so I'm assuming it has been edited or somehow altered to give him credit. 
But it was interesting to see like the, the research uh, that is noted for why this item is here. Might be the only place where the Seventh Day Adventists are referred to as less radical. I don't know a lot about them, so I cannot comment on that. Um, let's see. Ah. So, interesting. He, it details the research and then it relates the portion of the manuscript, but at the end he notes the manuscript ends, or rather runs into insane, insane ravings about freedom and the bliss of the planetary state. Uh, then follow interjections, dashes, blots, and mere disjointed insane sentences, which the present editor can, no wise, can in no wise decipher, nor does he care to. That's an interesting way to end a story, I guess. Oh, a puddle of them. I've heard of Made of Meat. I don't know that I've ever read it. Uh, and I can't, off the top of my head, remember who the author is. Let's see, Standing Ovation in a Field of Flowers by John Cooper. I might read excerpts of things. Squaw Man by Jack Wodums. Cosmic Boo Boo, Scott Edelstein. Also, this is just the first magazine. We have others to look at. Jekyll and Hyde Mushrooms. Who is N.G. Tucky? That's a name I'm not familiar with, but this story title intrigues me. And so now I want to look up N.G. Tuckle, or Tucky. You're confined to your mobile device due to some technical unco uncooperativeness, but you, did you hear Seventh-day Adventist? Are we talking food, di food diet history again? No, uh, uh, Kira, you did indeed hear Seventh-day Adventist. Um, we were talking about uh, the Millerites because we're talking um, uh, speculative fiction and there was an item in here that is apparently something from Knickerbocker's Magazine from July of 1853 um, that is a retelling of the story of the Millerites, apparently. Or something like that. I'm not sure. I, I lost the plot. Um, interesting for tongue-in-cheek predictions and satire directed at the Millerites. So it, it's, it's a speculative fiction story that was intended as satire about the Millerites, um, who eventually became Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> the author of Made of Meat is Terry Bisson. Obviously not for this stream, uh, but well worth meeting, or reading. I'm gonna look up this um, NG Tucky, because I am not familiar. And I'm curious. And they may not even be big enough. Nope, they, they are not big enough to have an entry in the science fiction encyclopedia. <laughs> no, not turkey. Google, come on. I said, I spelled it the way that I wanted it spelled. It didn't even give me a, did you mean to say this? It, it just literally made the change itself. Ah, okay, there is an entry in the International Science Fiction Database. Um, yeah, this is the only story attributed to this author. You're angry there's no town named, named Obscurity in the US. Really? It, I thought it said that there was. 
He died in obscurity. Now a country seat in Wyoming. So there's not an obscurity in Wyoming? There's, there's no place called obscurity in Wyoming? That makes me sad. So the Jekyll and Hyde mushrooms is the only item attributed to NG Tucky. <clears throat> Which means there's not a whole lot of information about this author. Oh! Noel Tucky. Noel George Tucky was born at Wow, New Guinea and began a distinguished writing career as a freelance journalist and columnist at age 35, contrib contributing articles to motoring and boating publications based in Japan, England, New England, or sorry, New Zealand and Australia. His interests include antique vehicle restorations, historic car racing, and writing enormously entertaining novels. Huh. That's the biography of him from Siddhartha Books uh, for his book, because he had a, a book published titled Thylacine Man. <laughs> well, let's see how this one starts. I won't read the whole thing because 1976, uh, definitely still under copyright, but, but we can read a couple of paragraphs and see how, see how his writing is, and maybe you'll be inclined to check out the work of N.G. Tucky. <clears throat> the shadows were cold, and Joel shivered as he walked into the jungle away from the warm winter sun. He liked the jungle to be close to the house for shade in the summer. Although in winter the big trees threw long shadows and the air was always damp, he, want, he wondered briefly if his blood was becoming thinner as he grew older, tempted to turn back for a warm jacket. He threw the sharp wood axe alternately between his big hands and started jogging along the track to keep out the chill, heading for the old dead pine tree he was using for firewood. Joel ran easily, head back, watching the tangled overgrowth for bird life, his peripheral vision guiding his feet in their rhythm. This was a trick he had learned as a boy, using his main eyesight to look at things of interest, letting his side vision tell him where he was going. He was looking hard at a wild bee's nest high in the fork of a ghost gum, and almost fell over the girl as she lay sprawled in crooked ugliness across the track, uh, sidestepping with ankle-wrenching suddenness around her. Instantly aware, the axe in both hands now, he looked rapidly around, tensing for danger. Heartbeat violent in his ears, the wind stirred quietly in the treetops, a bird calling briefly in the still, and nothing moved. He looked at the girl for the first time now, the bright red and white of her body incongruous against the soft greens and browns of the vegetation, stained blonde hair covering her face. Joel moved slowly toward her, concerned at the bright red, at the bright red blood sticky on her skin, cautious at her um, nakedness. The skin was cold to touch as he felt uh, as he felt her pulse, st uh, still stirring faintly under his questing fingertips. She had been pretty once, now pain etched deep lines and black swelling bruises on her throat, and face turned him <clears throat> cold inside. Ha- oh dear. Yep, I'm gonna stop there, I think. Um, cause it, it gets a little more graphic from that point, and um, So yeah, I'm, I'm just, I will let you check that one out on your own if you wish to <laughs> in the future. <laughs> I mean, I had already gotten indications that it was not exactly one I was going to want to read too much of on stream, but I saw the next sentence and I was like, nope, we're going to stop right there. Um, Veiled Pool of Misterac. That looks kind of, from the illustration, I would assume this is more of a fantasy story. <laughs> yeah, no, Puddle Glum. It did not waste any time. Kelly Country. 
A. Bertram Chandler. This is one of the more famous Australian science fiction authors. Um, let me look at his entry. I mean, there's an award named after A. Bertram Chandler. Uh, a, or, well, I guess he's, okay. UK-born author who served in the Merchant Navy from 1928 and who emigrated to Australia in 1956, where he commanded merchant ships under Australian and New Zealand flags until his retirement in 1975. The long professional experience, <clears throat> sorry, this long professional experience permeated his writing and many of his novels feature spaceships and flotillas whose command structures are decidedly naval. Chandler began publishing with This Means War for Astounding in May 1944 on John W. Campbell Jr.'s invitation and concentrated on short fiction for almost two decades, often under the pseudonym George Whitley in the USA and in the UK, less frequently as Andrew Dunstan and SHM, both only in Australia. He published no books during this period, and maybe for that reason, he was until the late 1960s less well known than he perhaps deserved, even though some of his best stories date from, his early, or from early in his career. For some time, Chandler was known mainly as the author of Giant Killer, October 1945 Astounding, a pocket universe tale which dominates the work posthumously assembled from, in From Sea to Shining Star, uh, and whose solitary prominence suggests that although he published nearly 200 stories over several decades, he was not entirely comfortable in shorter forms. Um, yeah, the entry is very long. You're welcome to look it up yourself on um, the sciencefictionencyclopedia.com. Um, for pulpiness. <laughs> So, it's interesting they had a, a picture of him there. Um, let me look at, because we have, it's, it's been 45 minutes and we've only gotten to one issue. Uh, here is uh, another issue of Void. Lovely illustration on the front here of an alien. Again, still just one dollar, assuming Australian dollar since this is an Aussie imprint. Space Age Books. One of the biggest selections of science fiction and associated books, comics, posters, and records in the world. Send 50 cents in stamps now and we will send you a bundle of our information-packed catalogs, news and reviews, snippets of trivia, as well as the latest releases. <clears throat> so this issue has a novelette called The Mask Behind the Face by Jack Wodums. Non-Void News, Science Fact. Short Stories, One Way to Tomorrow by Wynne and Whiteford. The Language of Sonoki by Dan La Don Laycock. Connoisseur by Joe Worley Jr. In Line of Duty by Frank Brining. A Matter of Life or Death by Paul Harwitz. The One Who Spoke with the Owls by Daryl Schweitzer. Another Out of the Vault, although this one is much later in the book this time. I think we should look at the science fact section in here and see what's there. Science fact from the news team. Lagos is the ninth laser ranging satellite to orbit the Earth which will assist scientists to measure movements on Earth's surface. The object of Lagios is to provide preliminary data which could assist scientists in predicting earthquakes. Other attributes uh, Lagios has is that it will determine Earth's crustal motions and give us vital information regarding Earth's rotation and polar motion. Lagios, as pictured opposite, would be best described as an oversized golf ball. This satellite is a two-foot diameter aluminum sphere with a brass core, the latter being inserted to make Lagios heavy enough to provide a large mass to surface ratio, aluminum being too light by itself. The satellite is covered with 426 retroflectors, 422 of which are fused silica for use with optical wavelength lasers, and the remaining four are germanium for use with infrared lasers. 
A laser beam is reflected by the retroflectors back to its original source regardless of the angle at which it is received. The uncoated cube corner reflectors have a circular face 1.5 inches 3.8 centimeters in diameter, and the back corner angle or the dihedral angle is 90 degrees plus 1.25 arc seconds plus 0.5 arc seconds. The 900 pound 409 kil kilogram Lag uh, Lagios was launched by NASA from a Delta launch vehicle. It is traveling in a 3,200 nautical mile, 5,900 kilometer, circular near polar orbit. It is hoped that after some six other satellites are added to the troop already orbiting Earth, that the accuracy of these satellites will improve to better than five centimeters or two inches. The San Andreas Fault in California will be given priority and other notorious parts of the globe where earthquakes are frequent will follow in quick succession. <clears throat> Honestly, that's pretty cool that they're including this whole, like, science fact section here. It continues on page 34. <clears throat> I think it's interesting. So a lot of the authors in this one are less well known. Huh. All I see are, are Klingon uniforms for female Klingons from Star Trek. Um, Sorry, uh, the, uh, the boob window was apparently a thing. Let's see, let's, let's look. We've got two more issues of Void and we've got some other magazines to look at. So let's, let's continue uh, perusing. Again, if you see something uh, and you specifically want me to take a look at it, do let me know. I'm happy to, um, dive in on something if you want to just drop it in chat and let me know hey that looked interesting <laughs> just here for coffee yeah <clears throat> the second void so apparently this was the second issue hey look we have not just uh, female bodies depicted in illustrations. Um, here is a, a decidedly male presenting body. Um, let's see, the novelette in this one. So this, this is a thing that became common in pulp. Um, so you get short stories. A lot of it is short stories. A lot of there's often a letter from the editor. There's often, um, it, indeed, many of the pulp sci-fi's include uh, a section on science fact, um, industry news, things like that. Uh, but then you get what are called novelettes, which are slightly longer short stories. Um, and so this one has, by the second issue, started including a novelette and then short stories. <clears throat> so the novelette here is the 200-1 Asset by Jack Wodums. Short stories Among the Dead by Edward Bryant. The Jackals Below by Victor R. Edwards and Richard J. Patton. The Stone Sermon by Gregory Fitzgerald. Change of Life by Patrick G. Connor. Occupational Hazard by Paul Harwitz. That's a fairly well-known name. I did so see a flying saucer. Or, sorry. I did so see a flying saucer by Frank Brining. Dreams of Ash. Memories of Fire by Carl Hansen. And Harry Parents by A. Bertram Chandler. <coughs> Games. <laughs> Undead Who Lifts. <laughs> Oh, 
all you can think of are the videos you've seen by Jill Bearup, where she discusses or rants about female armor in sci-fi and fantasy settings. It's a thing, Puddle Glum. Um, like, this illustration in here is not atypical. Let me see if I can find it again. Um, and we can discuss. <clears throat> like, we need to talk about practicality of clothing. So, the illustration here, this is very common. So here you've got, I don't even know what story this is. Let's, uh, this is a, a Wodum's. Um, this is the one who spoke with the owls, it looks like. Unless this is for the next one? No, this is The Mask Behind the Face by Jack Wodum's. Um, and so you've got this, this, uh, illustration of a, a man here who has a very strong jaw. He's in profile. He's got that slicked back hair. Honestly, he looks sort of like the 11th Doctor, uh, the Matt Smith Doctor from Doctor Who. Um, it's sort of that kind of face. Um, <laughs> uh, what year was Barbarella? So this would have been like 1976, 1977. Um, whoops. And Barbarella is 1968. So this is definitely, this is like a decade after Barbarella. Um, yeah, this, this was like a decade after, but you've got this whole like triplets look and and in Barbarella the holes in her outfit were put there by creatures biting into her like she had a skin tight suit but it was a full skin tight suit until the creatures bit her and so they were bite marks putting the holes in her outfit uh, these outfits were clearly designed with these flesh windows um, and there doesn't seem to be a practical purpose for them uh, but this is a very common way that women were illustrated in science fiction and fantasy at the time. And honestly, through today, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, computer gaming and stuff like that, you still get, or even like I was referencing before, um, the, the Star Trek series um, through Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, um, you get these weird cleavage windows, often referred to as boob windows in, in the Klingon battle armor. And uh, you see very unusually, uh, I mean, very form-fittingly designed armor in fantasy settings and, and television series and things like that, where the breastplate is made to encompass the breasts, but it would not be functional that way because it would direct any sword blow directly into that groove, which would actually compromise the armor's effectiveness. So if you look at a more modern series like Game of Thrones, and you look at the um, the female knight character in Game of Thrones, who's, I, I can't recall the character's name at the moment, but you look at her armor, it doesn't have armor breasts. It's just a breastplate, a flat breastplate, because that's actually structurally sound from an armor standpoint. Um, and, and so a functional design instead of enhancing the, uh, uh, like sexualizing the design. Um, Brienne of Tarth, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> there is a purpose for them, but not a practical one. Uh, yes, the same actor was also Phasma in Star Wars, which also had a practical armor design. Like that scene in Phantom Menace when Padma gets her midriff ripped off by an alien saber-toothed cat. I don't recall that, Soybot, but I will take your word for it. Um, so, yeah, it, it is worth just noting, like, this is a common depiction of the feminine form in um, science fiction and fantasy illustration throughout uh, 
the entire 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, less common, actually, is to have this much flesh showing on a male form. Um, up until you start getting like the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is the sort of the time period where you start to get uh, a more sexualized male uh, body marketed to a mass audience. Uh, you, you would have a body like this on like a romance novel or something like that, but it was much less common in science fiction and fantasy. Oh, it was Attack of the Clones, not Phantom? I still don't remember it, but... <laughs> um, so I just... Uh, that seemed like something worth, worth kind of talking about and looking at. Um, what was I going to look at in here? There was something that looked interesting. Oh, Paul Harwitz. Oh, hang on one second. It's interesting. This thing... My control board timed out and I had to log back in. <laughs> um, am I going out? No, I am. This is showing me the wrong channel. Okay, good. Now I think I know what, uh, what's going on. <sighs> I wish it wouldn't do that. That's very disconcerting when it does that. Um, basically leaves her unscathed but extra cute. Of course. I mean, you did have in the early, like in the um, 1960s Star Trek, um, every single time, and they, they make a joke out of it in um, Lower Decks and honestly in some other uh, Star Trek incarnations, but every time Kirk got into a physical fight, his shirt would be shredded or lost in some way. Uh, all right, Occupational Hazard by Paul Harwitz I was going to look at because Paul Harwitz is another name that sort of sticks out, but I do think we should probably talk about Jack Wodums in a second as well, because um, that is a rather um, large name in Australian science fiction. But I wanted to talk about Paul Harwitz first. Oh, come on. Huh. I know this name, and it, he's not showing up in the encyclopedia. Let me go to um, ISFDB. Paul Harwitz. William Shatner hated it because it meant getting his chest shaved. Oh dear. So Paul Harwitz, um, looks like in the Internet Science Fiction Database, there are three short fictions, uh, one essay and one review. Uh, we have Trump of Doom, Occupational Hazard, and A Matter of Life and Death as short fiction. Um, there's an essay here, review of the non-genre novel Run for Blood by George Warren. Um, let's see, but no description of who he is. Why do I know his name? Because I definitely have heard of him. Uh... but none of those are sticking out. He's got a Wikipedia entry. American physicist and electrical engineer known primarily for his electronics design. Is this the same person, I wonder? Let me look. Nope, this is not him.
Hmm. Well, apparently this author is just not famous enough. <laughs> uh... Summary bibliography. Wow. So this would be one where I would need to do some digging because I am not easily finding information about this author apart from a bibliography of works of his. Um, huh. Well, let's read a couple paragraphs and see what we think. <laughs> I, it, it didn't seem like it was the same person, the, the American, because it, the entry doesn't mention any, let's see. No, okay, so that's, that Wikipedia entry, um, Google served up Horowitz rather than Harwitz. So it was not the same. Trump of Doom sounds like an oddly prescient story. Yeah, be right, UK. Also, thank you for the 500 bits. Um, yeah. So yeah, Paul Horowitz, not the same as Paul Harwitz. Let's, we'll read a little bit and see if this one goes off the rails as quickly as the last thing I tried to read, and then we will glance at the last void and look at some of the other magazines here, because I have other publications too. Uh, he wondered if he was losing his sanity, or indeed if he had any left at all to lose. Uh, I will just mention that um, discussion of mental health has evolved quite a bit since the time that this was published. This is a historical document, and so uh, the way that it talks about mental health is likely not going to be how we would want to do so today. Uh, they were coming for him. Who were they? What they wanted, he couldn't guess, nor could he take time to hypothesize clearly. Their business suits hardly indicated typical muggers. Muggers would have terrified him much less. The alleyways and narrow Philadelphia side streets grew progressively more confusing and maze-like, an asset to him in seeking to hide, but also a disadvantage in so far as he lacked any familiarity whatsoever with the torturous twistings and turnings of the area where he sought to elude the hunters. His lungs ached and he felt a stabbing, disabling, pleuritic pain in his side from desperately running too far too fast. The joyless backs of tenements, condemned buildings, and moldering vacant warehouses seemed to close in on him from all sides. Hurried footsteps all around him hounded his harried footfalls. They, whoever they were, were trying to tire him out and converge on him. He knew it. Remorselessly, they advanced upon him. He scrambled over a low, rickety wooden fence, the paint of which had flaked off years before, raced across a small vacant lot littered with all manner of debris, and rushed into a narrow alley which promised to lead directly into a busy street whose noises he could hear as he dashed toward it. He barely averted, running straight into the high brick wall which unexpectedly denied him his freedom. The only way out of the dead end was the way he had entered, and now they completely blocked that off. Closing ranks to form a living barrier, they crushed toward him. For a few brief moments, he clawed at the brick wall in desperation, as if to scale it with the aid of his fingernails. Realizing the utter futility of the situation, he turned to face his tormentors like a man, acting as if they had cornered a dangerous animal that they didn't want to give a chance to fight. They lunged forward, grabbed, uh, grabbed his arms, and held him securely behind his back, and quickly gagged him. He still struggled, but they soon subdued him by holding a cloth to his lower, uh, to his lower face and forcing him to breathe its chemical odor. Whatever its fumes were, they took immediate effect. Their prey immobilized, they silently removed him as the sun set upon their deed. With a single, with a singleness of purpose, they conveyed him elsewhere. When he awoke, he found himself in a totally white room wherein he could discern neither doors nor windows. He was strapped firmly to a table. What appeared to be a large refrigerator dominated the room. His captors gloated silently around him in a tight circle. Welcome back to consciousness, Mr. Kyanolsky, the apparent leader addressed him. What am I... 
doing here? Why, why have we done this to you? What do we intend? The leader or spokesman or whatever, anno or whatever annoyingly interrupted the usual questions. Just thought I'd spare you the trouble. You write science fiction, don't you, Mr. Kayanowski? Yes, but I don't see what that... You will, you will. Your latest submission to Adventures in the Future magazine was a short story built around the idea that alien beings plotted to take over the Earth by means of chain letter type, or perhaps, I should say, chain reaction type blood transfusions. Personally, we find the entire genre of science fiction totally worthless. Your story, for instance, was poorly conceived, poorly planned, and poorly executed. Nevertheless, it hit too close to home in its central idea. Despite the fact that the odds of it ever getting published were quite slim, we decided not to take any chances. You see, one of the staff members assigned to the unpleasant task of reading unsolicited submissions has been one of us for some time now. If this is some kind of practical joke, really, Mr. Kainalski, that remark was uninspired enough to have come straight out of one of your insipid stories, or the stories you plagiarize. You somehow stumbled onto the correct general idea in your latest story, but you botched up the particulars. Your explanations were more medieval than scientific, but after all, your background is in science is virtually non-existent, so that accounts for that defect. What are you talking about? Simply this, we are systematically taking over this planet by means similar enough to those described by you in your absurd piece of fiction to merit our removal of any potential threat you might have posed. We already withdrew one liter of your blood while you were unconscious. Now we're going to replace it with one liter of ours. The artificial virus is contained and it will convert all of your body's cells, including your reproductive cells, into ours. In fact, should you mate with a human, the progeny will be totally like us. The process is fairly rapid, but your mind will change over before your entire body does. The microbiological manipulation techniques of our specially engineered DNA and RNA handle all that. Unfortunately, the takeover process can be accomplished only serologically, otherwise we would have contaminated your world's water supplies. You're, we're working on that problem, though, and might be able to devise a faster delivery serum if we can progress to non-serological methods. Your system will remain permanently infectious immediately after we treat you. The human race will have no way of detecting any difference in your blood, however. He saw no hope. He saw one hope, and only, and one hope only. We're not telepathic, Mr. Kajanowski, but we are extremely thorough in all of our methods. I don't have to read your mind to know what prospect just flashed across your face. Although, uh, allow me to shatter your imagined salvation. Understand that we read your story. No, Mr. Kajanowski, a 100% transfusion with human blood immediately after we, after we release you couldn't possibly cure you. Even if... Even if our blood wasn't as utterly insidious as it is, how could you ever convince any hospital to satisfy such a seemingly outlandish whim? Either the hero of your story was an amazingly convincing fellow, or else the obliging hospital staff were incredibly gullible. Remember also that our blood's effect is permanent. Now down to business. <laughs> You'd like to think he'd notice losing a liter of blood? Yeah. It also seems unsanitary. <laughs> Every alien is a sci-fi critic. Honestly, this story is off to a really good start. And actually, I think I have read the entire thing now, so let's, let's just read the last paragraph. I might as well at this point. They administered one liter of their blood from a prepared container and apparatus. After completing the transfusion, they gave him a steak to eat, milk to drink, and a dietary iron capsule to swallow. He complied unwillingly. Something added to the food made him sleep as soon as he had finished eating. The next thing he knew, it was day again, and he was walking into a familiar building, confused but almost not caring how he had gotten there. Hello, Mr. Kajanowski! You never miss an appointment, do you? And you're a real regular around here. I don't know what we'd do without you. The nurse began to withdraw a unit of the donor's blood. That was the whole story. And it was really good! <laughs> Hi, Galara Dragon! <laughs> Half of the story was him dumping on his work. Um, I think... Uh, sorry, but I, I actually think that half of that story is not him 
criticizing his own work. I think it's him um, parodying criticisms of his work that he has received. I don't think he is actually like putting his own work down. I think he's um, doing a parody of commentary upon science fiction work that he has uh, received or um, encountered. A shame this is pre-Twitter. <laughs> this one sounds really interesting, but I'm not going to read it because we just read an entire story from this issue. I did so see a flying saucer by Frank Brining. Who's Frank Brining? Let's let's look. I'm not going to read this one, but we can at least look up the author. Possibly. We can try at least. Um, Frank Brining. 1907 to 1999, Australian author who began publishing work of genre interest with Miracle in the Moluccas as by Frank Cornish for Pocket Book Weekly in 1950. His employment as a senior editor for various journals hampered his writing career, which effectively ended in the 1950s, though he published some stories late in life after his retirement in 1973. Uh, two series, The Joan Buckley Tales about a telepath and The Vivian Gale or Commonwealth S Satellite Space Station Tales about a woman doctor in space were restricted to magazine publication in 1954 to 55 for the first and 52 to 56 for the second. Brining lacked a certain flamboyance, but his work was noted for its scientific realism. Journey into Orbit, 1980, was a science fiction tale for children. Huh. Bolding the word sum is an interesting editorial choice. There are a number of individual words that are bolded in this story. Honestly, Hannah, I don't know. Also, I'm, I'm currently rolling over the, the headphone cord. Give me one second to try and untangle that. Um, Cause that's not good. There we go. Um, I don't know and I don't have, um, I would have to do research to be able to find out if the Paul Harwitz who wrote that last story also wrote cowboy fiction. Um, it's entirely possible. I just was not in, in brief searches able to find enough information about this Paul Harwitz uh, to really get any in information on who he is. Um, these are Australian publications, so I would be expecting something along those lines, like somebody from Australia, but not necessarily so. Ooh, we've got the first Sydney Science Fiction Film Fest. April 2nd and 3rd, 1977 at the Union Theater at the University of Sydney. A different program each day. will include the wi widest possible coverage of audiovisual science fiction, including feature films, perhaps a premiere, TV sci-fi, Australian sci-fi, classics of horror and science fiction. Um, so we've got the giveaway by Jack Wodums got Russell Ward, we've got Samuel Drexler, John J. Alderson, Frank Brining, Daryl Schweitzer, and Van Eiken. Um, we have science fact again. That was fun last time. Let's look again. Page 50. Science fact! Ape talk? Uh, 
Language capabilities or the communication of ideas from man to man and man to his environment have been the basis for much of the psychology of man and imagery related to Freudian and Jungian psychoanalytical philosophical research and documentation. The importance of language and the abilities requisite to affect meaningful communication of separate philosophical word, expression, or gesture quotients between communicating entities is a major underlying premise of the daily operation and interfunctioning of all aspects of culture. Prior to the 60s, the language capabilities and aptitudes of our zoological next of kin, the primates, had been thought to be most exemplary in the chimpanzee. Recent studies at Stanford University in the U.S. are rapidly reshaping this theory as the language capabilities of the previously thought intellectual inferior, the gorilla, the primate whose hands, feet, and pelvis most resemble characteristically those physiological attributes deemed biologically human, are surfacing rapidly. The earliest documented attempts to teach an orangutan uh, language are those of Englishman William Furness, who in 1916 managed to teach a primate to say cup when it required water. And as it lay dying, it called cup, cup, cup. Studies over the ensuing 60 years concentrated on the use of gestures and signs rather than words in phonetic form and have proven a greater facility for the learning and communication processes between primates and psychologists. Go on to talk about Stanford's Coco. It's an interesting science fact to encounter in here. I don't know exactly what was the year for this one. This one does. This is the first edition. So. I believe that was like 1975? I'm not certain, I don't remember. Why is the Science Society of American Engineers coming up? Or is that... Oh, Society of Automotive Engineers. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, essay can be a number of different things, but... Um. <laughs> You're used to seeing it as sassy. But you don't even see that anymore. I, I just, why, why are we talking about it? I, I don't know how it came up, but en enjoy your conversation. Oh, it said, please enclose S-A-E. Oh. So this is not the Society of American, or of, of Automotive Engineers. This is something else. Stamped addressed envelope. Yeah, that's what it means. Self-addressed self stamped envelopes, S-A-S-E. So what's, what's funny is S-A-E to me, I went immediately to engineering. Um, and SASE, S-A-S-E, I also went to engineering. Uh, <laughs> but that's because we have large engineering collections here. So, um, all right, let's move on from void. Um, this one, uh, let's see, I think we have two, three, four, four issues of this magazine. Yeah, it was the ad, and I, I found it, but um, so, we have this tiny one here. This one is actually smaller than the Void 
magazine that we were just looking at. But it also has the, this much larger form factor. So I, I actually have three different sizes of Thrills Incorporated. Uh, all the same publication, just very different in size. And remember how Void was described as being printed on um, cheap paper? This is much, much cheaper paper. This is, this I would definitely say is pulp. Um, SSAE, also known, is also an option. So let me go ahead and pull up uh, Thrills Incorporated. And let's see what we can learn about them. Thrills Incorporated, Australian magazine, pulp format one through five, bed sheet format six through 12, digest format 13 through 23, numbered undated, mostly March 1950 to June 1952, published by Associated General Publications, Sydney, company name changed to transport publications from number 13, mostly edited by uncredited, uh, Alistair Inez, Thrills Incorporated was intended for adolescence. Although US reprints as such were not used, plagiarism did occur without the publisher's knowledge. For instance, Synthetic Alibi, 1950, number eight, by D.K. Garten, was really Marionettes Incorporated. March, 1949, Starling Stories by Ray Bradbury. These pirated stories by Charles L. Harness, Murray Leinster, Clifford D. Simak, William Ten and others were the only good stories printed. This practice ceased after issue number nine, and the magazine ran mostly news stories by Alan G. Yates and G. C. Bleak, 1907 to 1971, some under the name of Belly, Belly Luigi and Norma K. Hemming, writing as N. K. Hemming. Some stories were reprinted in the UK, Amazing Science Stories. A sister publication from the same company was Scientific Thrillers. You don't always fight off rocket ships, but when I do, I send an Amazon writing a Pegasus. Yeah, that does appear to what, be what that is. An Amazon riding a Pegasus being chased by a rocket ship. Amazons of the asteroids! Adventures in space and the world of tomorrow. So this is from the 1950s. We know that. Uh, they did say they're undated. Um, this is issue number 17, which is the digest format. What is this? So we have number eight here. And we have... Ooh, we have issue number one. Let's look at issue number one. So this, this is the pulp format. This is the bed sheet format, which is slightly larger. And then this would be the digest format, which is unsurprisingly the size of a reader's digest, if you've ever heard of that publication, but much, much smaller. Uh, Amazons of the Asteroids looks interesting. We'll want to go back to that and look at that in a moment. Um, the Amazon is not flying fighting off the rocket ship, probably just delivering some home electronics the ship ordered. Lord Portico, oh my, oh my. <sighs> Rightly so tries to ban himself. <laughs> Thrills Incorporated, Adventures in Space and the World of Tomorrow. Uh, so this is number one, issue number one. Um, Nine dollars. So Void Magazine from the 70s was one Australian dollar. This was nine dollars in the 50s. <laughs> Open top rockets, of course. Why would you need, uh, I mean, they've got, they've got helmets. Why would they need an enclosed rocket? 
Space Race, a startling novel by Belly Luigi. Also, novelettes by Evie Zins. Wolf Herschelt. So, Belly Luigi was mentioned here. Uh, so, this is actually GC Bleak. <laughs> 100 miscreant bits. Thank you, Puddle. Um, oh, that's a great question, Galara. Um, so let, let's get an official definition of a digest-sized publication. Uh, I am looking for a good, uh... Ah! Ah, here we go. <laughs> because you digest them. Digest size is a magazine size smaller than a conventional or journal size magazine, but larger than a standard paperback book. Approximately 14 centimeters by 21 centimeters, or five and a half by eight and a quarter inches. But can also be 13.65 centimeters by 21, 27 centimeters, or five and three eighths by eight and three eighths inches. And 14 centimeters by 19 centimeters, or five and a half by seven and a half inches. Similar to the size of a DVD case. These sizes have evolved from the printing press operation end. Some printing presses refer to digest size as catalog size. The digest format was considered to be a convenient size for readers to tote around or to leave on the coffee table within easy reach. The most famous digest size magazine is Reader's Digest, from which the size appears to have been named. TV Guide also used the format from its inception in 1953 until 2005. Coffee House Digest is a national magazine distributed free of charge at coffee houses throughout the United States. Birdwatcher's Digest is an international magazine that has retained its digest size since the creation in 1978. Uh, it's less popular now than it once was. Um, TV Guide dropped it in favor of a larger format. The science fiction magazines Analog and Asimov's had switched to a format slightly larger than digest size several years earlier. The main publications remaining in digest size now are Reader's Digest, Prevention, Guidepost Magazine, and some Archie Comics digests. Children's Digest was originally in digest size but switched long ago to a larger format as well, uh, while keeping the word digest in its name. Writer's Digest is another publication with the word in its name that is not actually produced at that size. Uh, science Fiction Digests. Since the 1950s, it has also been used by several science fiction magazines, including Analog, which was originally titled Astounding, um, Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine, Galaxy Science Fiction, The Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, New Worlds, Other Worlds, Science Fantasy, and Worlds of If. Um, and of those, off the top of my head, I think the only one that still publishes in digest size is the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which honestly, I can't be 100% certain because it's been a while since I had a subscription to that magazine. And the last time I subscribed to it, I was only getting it in ebook form. Um, but the last time I got a physical publication of uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, it was digest sized. Um, it's slightly larger than a book, Galara. So um, it's, it's more like the dimensions of a DVD case. Ooh, just here for coffee, thank you. At the time of publication, Australia used pre-decimalized currency, the same as the UK, so the price was nine pence. 
D for denarius, denarius, as the old coin used Latin abbreviations. So not nine dollars, it was nine denarius. Thank you for that clarification just here for coffee. I was not aware of that. Book size names, some wholesome library fun. Easier to digest, bite-sized readings, metaphorically. Yeah, um, essentially a format that was meant to be easier to use, easier, pardon me, easier to carry with you. It's small enough to fit inside your purse if you're a lady, um, or to just uh, easily carry with you if you're a guy, because guys didn't tend to carry bags. Although I guess it would have fit in a briefcase fairly easily. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so it, w it was meant for to just be smaller and easier to transport. Um, plus generally included shorter stories, um, shorter uh, forms of writing. So rather than like a novel uh, that takes a while to get through, it's something that you could sit down and easily digest a story within a few minutes. I don't know if that has anything to do with where the name came from, but um, that's what they were typical for. Good for pockets, bad for digestive tracts, indeed. Um, all right, Thrills Incorporated, Asteroid Adventure by, oh, wow, somebody has written in pencil who the authors are. Wolf Hersholt, uh, Castaway Planet by Evie Zins, and Space Race, full-length novelette by Belly Luigi. The largest book in our collection is described as Double Elephant Folio. Yes, do not attempt to eat the, eat the Double Elephant Folio. It is, um, a, repro a 1980s reproduction of the Audubon Birds of America. Um, it is double elephant folio. It has four volumes, I believe, and they are very large. It takes uh, two people to really, well, it takes two people to switch out the books, and it's much easier to turn the pages if you've got two people. They are very large, and all of the birds inside are illustrated in actual size. So yeah, it's big enough that there is a full-size flamingo, although the flamingo has its head dipping down to the ground. Otherwise, the book would have to be quite a lot taller. <coughs> but handy for literary inclined pachyderms. <laughs> um, asteroid adventure. And, and someday, someday, I will do a program where we tour downstairs, where we tour the actual archives. Um, I need to confirm that we have the setup all set up to be able to do that roving tour. Um, I'm not exactly certain how that's going to function. Some details still to work out. But when I do that, you'll get to see the Audubon Birds of America. Lorge Burbs! Yes. Ooh, yay! You're using the burb emote. That makes me so happy. Castaway planet. Um, race against time. Bella, Belly Luigi. Uh, let's let's see what what the encyclopedia has to say about this Belly Luigi person. Belly Luigi. Space Race, an interplanetary novel by Belly Luigi. It looked like Professor Mountfield had just the ship to make interplanetary travel child's play. That's why a few others took a hand in his game, only they wanted to play it rough. Belly Luigi, an Australian house name, or more likely pseudonym, used by Australian author G.C. Bleak author of a large number of westerns under the various names including Brad Cordell, and of thrillers under his own name. As Belly, he is responsible for some short science fiction in Thrills Incorporated, and several novella-length tales in science of science fiction interest published in the sister magazine Scientific Thrillers, usually as whole issues. These include Cosmic Calamity, featuring a mad scientist, a ray gun, and a quest for world domination. Death Has No Weight, featuring an anti-gravity machine. Lightning Crime, in which invisibility is exploited by criminals. Crime Files, featuring a remote-controlled flying robot. The Glowing Globe, uh, Luigi's title story being a time travel tale. And Mastermind Menace, involving identity transfer. So he... 
in the 40s and 50s was using a lot of uh, very science fiction tropey um, uh, tropes. Tropey tropes. <laughs> a lot of science fiction tropes that we know today. I could do a pre-recorded tour. That is true. Was not worth it. Um, yeah, I, I just need to figure out what the logistics are going to be. Um, and honestly, I would say the earliest it could happen is probably going to be spring break time um, because there's no way I'm going to pull the logistics together before the students return for the spring term. Uh, and I probably would want to be doing it when we are not going to have tons and tons of people around. Um, we'll just have to see. I don't know what kind of mobile camera setup we have. I know we had talked about just using a, an iPad for some of it um, and that that should be possible. I just, I need to work out what the logistics are for that. Belly Luigi, not to be confused with Bella Lugosi, indeed. I wonder if uh, the similarity to Bella Lugosi is why that name was chosen. Raygun is a space pirate descendant of Ben? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you plan to be on hand to pop up in random locations? Hey, you can, um, you can, I, that's great. Because I can do the tour. You're going to give the history of that Audubon much better than I will. Uh, so I'm just going to force you to do it. Um, let's see. Thrills Incorporated, Adventures in Space, and the World of Tomorrow. And here we have a very, very cold woman. Um, like, there's no way that that is a comfortable outfit for space travel. Also... I'm very curious about the oxygen generation capabilities of that arm cuff. <laughs> but you can see the guys here are like fully decked out in full suits and she's in a one piece swimsuit with a holster that is somehow attached to her leg. A tattoo of a number six. Um, she's got an air bubble helmet with a cord that could easily be cut that connects to an arm cuff. I'm confused about the air generation capabilities of that arm cuff. I assume there's no way that outfit is comfortable in general. Indeed, I agree. The random epaulets always amuse you. Spacesuit is not approved by OSHA or NASA. <laughs> Super glue. <laughs> we have Planet of Fire. The two planetoid prospectors of Asteroid Adventure return to thrills in a desperate adventure in a blazing inferno. Method for Murder by Otto Kench. Escaped Essence by Boris Ludwig. Jet Wheel Jockey by Wolf Herschelt. Even in the days of supersonic speed, a speedway rider could only go as fast as his ambition took him. But sometimes that was more than enough to take him over the parapet into oblivion. This, these are interesting. I mean, these are early. These are 1950s, which is uh solidly situated in the pulp era for science fiction like the 1970s stuff they're they're really sort of moving out of pulp um but the 1950s is definitely still very pulp exile in space by ace carter and they exile her in a bikini apparently she's never taking it off B, ouch, and C, why? Helmet's collar appears to be riveted directly to her clavicle. Yeah. Well, this, this lady was shot into space in a, uh, a clear-fronted rocket. Um, from 
the surface of a moon? The, she, she's, she's launching from a cratered surface with no plant life. So, I don't know. Uh, the cover on this one has come off. You can see that the condition of the pages is much worse on this um, <clears throat> 1950s era, very pulp quality paper. Um, this is issue number eight, Exile in Space by GC Bleak. Spying in space was not such a, not a soft pastime. The, playbo the playboy of the planets was a toughie when roused. Inevitable Conflict by Ace Carter. Suspended in space for 5,000 years, they returned to Earth to find... Dash. Okay, now I have to look at page 10 and see if it tells me any more. Yeah, that is a very sharp angle. Inevitable Conflict by Ace Carter. 5,000 years of progress and men with courage still face conflict inevitably. Library finds had bankrupted their descendants. These are very reminiscent of like superhero illustration. I don't know who the artist is. But the graphical style and like the just general shapes, uh, I mean, he looks like he could be in a DC or Marvel comic from the same era. Um, also here, like the face on this, the girl flung herself deliberately in the path of the atom flame gun's fire. An instant later, she was a mass of incandescent flame. Just, just like the, the illustrative style, the, the lines present reminds me of comics, uh, from sort of this same 1950s era. Uh, let's see if there's any indication of who the artist is. I doubt there is. All of the art in here seems to be done by the same person, but there is no credit on in the beginning of this, and there's nothing at the back. So we don't know who the artist is. Uh, it might be possible to find out. Sometimes it is possible to find out who the artist is um, by doing some research and finding similar or related things. Very Flash Gordon-like. Uh, fluid Ann. Oh, absolutely, Puddle Glum. Um, you can even post the link uh, in chat. Uh, Kira is giving you permission to, to just drop the link directly in chat, but it would also be appreciated if you want to drop it in the Discord. I can, I can look at it later then. Uh, <laughs> I don't often get a chance to go back and, and visit the links that are dropped in chat. Um, oh, and here we have on the back an ad for self-supporting self-supporting trousers. No need for suspendies. <laughs> um, and then we have the digest-sized one with the Amazon Amazons of the asteroids. We don't have a lot of time left. Um, oh boy. I still have three other magazines we didn't even get to. I knew this was going to happen. Um, we'll glance at them. I will read the information about them, but let's see. Amazons of the Asteroids is by N.K. Hemming. Invasion of the Insec Insectants by G.C. Bleak. And Planet of the Lost by Alan Yates. Amazons of the Asteroids. Of course they couldn't exist, these women warriors of the multi-worlds, but they proved too deadly to be, to be mere theories or mirages. N.K. Hemming is, is a definitely known Flash Gordon. He's in his 70s now, just calls himself Gordon. Don't know why that's the one that stuck in the past. I don't know either. Uh... Hemming. Yes, okay, so N.K. Hemming is Norma K. Hemming. 
Uh, UK born science fiction fan and author. In Australia from 1949, she began publishing work of genre interest, usually as N.K. Hemming with Loser Take All uh, and Death Ray for Roma, releasing about 20 further stories before her early death, including Amazons of the Asteroids, a, a Utopia. Uh, the Norma K. Hemming Award was founded in 2009 and is given rather on the model of the James Tiptree Jr. Award for excellence in the exploration of themes of race, gender, class, and sexuality. The star shell had hit the fringes of, of the dust belt a couple of weeks out from Mars. The first few days plowing through the asteroid orbit had not been too bad, but they were deep in now and it was not only dust that crossed their path. She was an experimental ship, the first to attain the 37 miles a second to escape Jupiter's gravity where she was heading now. 2273 was the age of exploration. Venus and Mars had been visited. Then the Earth explorers turned longing eyes at Jupiter's huge bulk. The star shell's crew were not large, a customary small scout sent out to make a preliminary survey. The larger forces would follow later. Floyd Estrom, her pilot and astrogator, Lee Jackson, engineer, and Dr. Gurnitz supplied an all-round all knowledge of science for the project. The fourth member of the party could not really be put into any category, but he had proved himself too useful to be left behind on any trip. He was economical, too. He did not breathe or eat and existed solely on ultraviolet rays. He floated now in the middle of the cabin, a little glass-like sphere filled with a thick, swirling, creamy substance like heavy fog and sometimes appeared lit by sparks. In fact, Durga the Venusian could give out quite a nasty little shock if he felt like it. The video screen showed a large meteor headed for them, and Floyd instinctively ducked. He knew the force field around the star shell would shunt it aside if it was small enough. If not, the compact little electronic brain would make a split-second determination of its course and turn the ship. Uh, but... He still had that desire to duck a flying missile every time one of those erratic wanderers of space turned up. Here we have an illustration. Medusa raised her scepter with a shrill cry. The Pegasus thundered across the ground, wings unfolded, and the spacemen, spacemen were borne away. So I'm not going to read much, but um, if you are not familiar with Norma K. Hemming or N.K. Hemming, uh, definitely give a check to her work. Um, she is an important uh, science fiction author. Um, and as noted, there's an, there's an award named for her that um, <clears throat> is given for excellence in the exploration of themes of race, gender, class, and sexuality. Um, let's look at the other magazines that we have here. Uh, we have Vision of Tomorrow, which we have quite a few issues of and which I cannot show you the back of. Um, I must be very careful not to show you the back because... Uh, Women's exposed breasts are not allowed on Twitch. And the, the ad on the back has a topless female in it. <clears throat> but let's see what we can learn about Vision of Tomorrow. Vision of Tomorrow. Australian slash UK magazine, monthly, A4 size, 12 issues, August 1969 to September 1970. Published by Ronald E. Graham, an Australian businessman and science fiction enthusiast, edited by Philip Harbolet, or sorry, Philip Harbottle from the UK, the magazine was printed on good quality coated paper stock. Uh, but to call it a slick magazine would be stretching the definition. Nevertheless, the production and presentation carried out almost single-handedly by Harbottle was neat and clean. The magazine's content was in stark contrast to New Worlds, which was at its most extreme at that point. Vision of Tomorrow presented more traditional science fiction, following in the footsteps of John Carnell's original New Worlds. Vision of Tomorrow featured work by many UK writers, inclu including Kenneth Bulmer, Michael Moorcock, and E.C. Tubb, with the emphasis on straightforward action stories and several posthumous works by John Russell Fern. 
Graham vetoed the inclusion of U.S. writers, but the publishing agreement stated that the content could be at least 40% by Australian authors. These included Damian Broderick, Lee Harding, and Jack Wodums. Cover artists included Eddie Jones, Gerard, Gerard A. Quinn, and David Hardy, the latter also producing many full-color illustrations on the inside back cover. Vision of Tomorrow was the first English-language magazine to publish a story by Stanislaus, uh, Stanislaw Lem, are you there, Mr. Jones? In number one, The Impatient Dreamers, a history of UK science fiction publishing and fandom by Walter uh, Gillings, E.G. Carnell, and others ran through all issues. Uh, because of a change of printers, number three appeared before number two. <clears throat> Based on the cover, we can learn why they still don't know how to dress women for space. Indeed. Price has gone up. That's five shillings, 60 old pence, or a quarter in US equivalent currency, if not actual value. Thank you for the price translations. And, and so one thing about the magazines and the illustrations, oftentimes the illustrations have nothing to do with the actual content of the stories. These seem to actually line up. So like the, the sort of Amazon one that we were looking at, the, the illustrations seem to match. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily track that because there is a very poorly clad woman here with a blaster gun uh, sort of jetpacking away while this weird red hand chases her. That doesn't mean that Cassandra's Castle by Lee Harding has anything to do with that. Um, so let's see. This is ish volume one, issue number 12. This is the last issue. Uh, we have Laylee by Norman Lazenby, Cassandra's Castle by Lee Harding. Um, this one includes who the illustrators are. That's great. The Fauntleroy Syndrome by Brian and Ball. All the World's a Stage by Richard Gordon. The Slitherers by John Russell Fern. Um, and then Features, Memories of the Future by John Baxter and The Impatient Dreamers by John Carnell. Special back cover science article and painting. Mars, not so friendly neighbor. Um, not actually on the back cover, the back inside cover. It's actually quite a pretty painting here by Hardy, um, would have been a much better back cover than the actual back cover that I cannot show you. <laughs> because, oh, actually, I can show you the back cover of this one. Uh, the back cover of many of them is an ad for Heinlein's Glory Road and, um, Uh, there is a woman with a bow and a small person behind her and a dead dinosaur. Uh, Heinlein is acknowledged as the master of space age fiction, winner of several Hugo Awards. He has become recognized as a great writer in any field and an amazingly accurate prophet of the near and distant future. Glory Road embodies all of the author's remarkable talents in a breathtaking tale of an ordinary man thrust into a totally alien world. Um, but <clears throat> yes, she is in all her glory, so to speak, uh, which is why I have to cover her up. Um, because that is all the clothing she is wearing. Just that little twist around her waist. Um, and therefore, I am not showing you the, that back cover on stream beyond uh, what I already just showed you. Um, let's see, we've got... Actually, we've got a couple more here. Popular science fiction. So one pound three, is that? Uh. 
Um, popular science fiction. Australian Thin, 64 PP, I'm not sure what measurement that is. Digest sized saddle stapled magazine, six issues, undated but July 1953 to March 1955, published by Fru Publications, Sydney, editor not named but Ronald Forrester. It published primarily reprints from US pulps but included some Australian material by Norma K. Hemming and surprisingly by US authors, particularly in the final issue, which was almost all new material by Sam Sackett, Jim Harmon, and Louis Moore. In 1967, Page Publications, Sydney, reprinted issues 4 and 6 from the original series, but renumbered them to 1 and 2 with new covers. One shilling, three pence. Um, so this one has works by Chad Oliver, Alfred Koppel, Otis Edelbrecht Klein, Oscar J. Friend, and Philip K. Dick. Piper in the Woods by Philip K. Dick. Uh, again, noted um, it was mostly reprints of US from US pulps, so probably not the original publication place for the Philip K. Dick story. Um, boy, women just don't like to wear clothes in space, apparently. According to this, uh, all the men are fully clothed and the women are in bikinis. I just don't understand. Um, Murray Linster, Char H. Charles Blair, and John W. Jakes are the authors in, in this issue. We are extremely short on time. I'm just going to show the other magazines, and then, then I think we're kind of out of time. We have Science Fiction Monthly. Um, and like I said, this was all collected in the... 80s by um, by someone in North Carolina. So there were probably more Australian pulp magazines than what we have in our collection. Um, let's see. Name used by authentic science fiction in an early manifestation as Science Fiction Monthly, Australian digest size magazine published by Atlas Publications, Melbourne, edited anonymously by Michael Cannon, 18 numbered undated issues. The fiction, mostly reprinted from various US magazines, was fairly routine but included some good work by Ray Bradbury and others. The covers were reprinted from the same sources. There was minimal original Australian material. A non-fiction feature from number 12 onward was Graham B. Stone's column of commentary, Science Fiction Scene. <laughs> Poor weak men. They have to wear full clothing. And otherwise they can't survive in space. The women are clearly stronger because they don't need as many clothes. Uh, let's see. Selected. Hmm. Selected science fiction. Australian digest sized magazine, five slim, 32 PP saddle stapled monthly issues, May through September 1955, published by Malian Press, Sydney, edited anonymously by James Mitchell, selected science fiction, a companion to American science fiction magazine, reprinted U.S. material of quite good quality, including work by Philip K. Dick, James Blish, and Judith Merrill. All covers were by Stanley Pitt. The Enormous Room by H.L. Gold and Robert Kreps is what the cover is here. I actually feel like we did fairly good. Um, I was worried that we spent so much time on the magazines we did at the beginning, but the ones that we looked at first were the ones that had original Australian stuff in them, and the ones that we missed are the ones that reprinted US stuff. So I feel like we didn't actually miss out on things. Uh, which is amazing considering that as with every time I do this show, I don't actually look at the stuff ahead of time. Um, 
Future Science Fiction, variant title of Future Fiction in its 1950s incarnation. Uh, Australian Digest-sized magazine, six numbered undated issues running from July 1953 to March 1955, two in 1953, three in 1954, and one in 1955. Um, published by Fru Publications, Sydney, edited anonymously by Ronald Forster. Forster was assisted in the selection of material for issue number two by Vol Moldsworth and thereafter by Graham Stone. The stories were primarily reprints from various US sources, but issue number five carried three new Austra Australasian stories by Frank Brining, Norma Hemming, and John A. Vile. Issue number three, March 1954, also had a new story, Mixpedition by Norman E. Hartman, a name not otherwise known and a possible alias for Hemming. Uh, in 1967, Page Publications, Sydney, reprinted issues four and six from the original series, but renumbered them one and two with new covers. Um, the companion version to both versions was popular science fiction. Um, and this, uh, this illustration here is for associated on the cover with feature novel This Joe by A.E. Van Vogt. Um, James Blish also handled a lot of the original novelizations for Star Trek back before they started allowing others to play in their sandbox. Just for coffee, I did not know that. That is cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is the illustration that I used for the, uh, the um, promo for today's uh, program. I thought it was a very interesting uh, image with the exploding rocket in the background and all the bodies flying away from it. And then this, this guy in a vaguely... Um, uh, like a vaguely Robin Hood or Peter, vaguely Peter Pan-esque type outfit um, with the way that it's got the v-neck collar and the short sleeves and the, um, reaching out and the, the, the woman who's upside down in a dress that seems to be falling apart uh, and they're reaching for each other in space as, as the ship blows up behind them. I thought it was a very interesting um, image. I'm curious about what's going on and why they're not dead yet because there in the vacuum of space with no protective equipment. But you know, that's <laughs> something for another time. Um, inside here we have Milk Run by uh, Robert Donald Locke, This Joe by A.E. Van Vogt, Ordinary Men Couldn't Live on Mars Without Extra Oxygen, except for one man, and the others hated him. Uh, Mixpedition by Norman E. Hartman, which um, the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction noted uh, was likely an alias for uh, for Norma Hemming. Um, absolutely No Paradox by Leslie Del Rey. No War Tomorrow by Wallace West and Curtain in the Sky by Charles Dye. <laughs> Any connection between the characters and incidents in the fiction section of this book and living persons is accidental and not intended. So, I really, we are over time. I have to, I, I'm going to have to end for today. Um, thank you for coming and joining me uh, for a look at the Australian titles in our pulp science fiction collection. Um, we have a ton more stuff in pulp sci-fi. I will likely revisit it, uh, revisit it again in the future as this program continues um, because I really enjoy it. It's really cool and if I if I pull out some of the older stuff I can actually read entire stories without any sort of concern. Um, honestly for educational purposes I don't uh, and w this program I don't think it's a big issue if I read a story here or there but um, I try to steer away from reading entire ones of fully copyrighted works. Uh, so generally looking for things before 1926, which we do have. Um, but uh, next week, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, I will be live again on both channels for the next Archival Adventures. Next week, we will be looking at um, astronomical telescopes. So if you're not aware, the James Webb Space Telescope launched on Christmas Day and is currently on its way to the L2, uh, the um, L2 Lagrange point uh, for 
station keeping. Um, it has extended its solar uh, curtains. Um, it put up its tripod today. It's got two of its mirrors out and the main mirror uh, is still to deploy. Um, but it is a major infrared telescope that is uh, moving out to take a look into the stars. And so I thought it would be interesting to pull materials that we have in our collection related to some of our telescopes for far distant viewing. Uh, most of the material we have is related to the Hubble telescope and its launch and maintenance missions. So we will be looking at that. But we also have um, some materials on, uh, there's a radio telescope in West Virginia that we have um, something on. I think it might just be an image. But um, I thought it would be interesting if we took a look at that stuff. So that is the plan for next week. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just... <laughs> Key squared. Um, I, I am very uh, happy that you liked it. Um, oh, and I'm glad that you all are, are thinking that that sounds like a good plan for next week. Um, so yeah, that is, that is what we're going to do next week. Uh, it's going to be a lot of Hubble. It's going to be a lot of... Um, technical mission documentation that is going to be really dense for me and if you are familiar with it feel free to comment in the in the chat because um, I'm gonna be looking at it uh, I think some of it we will have seen before because I think we looked at at least one of them uh, once previously when I was looking at the Marjorie Taylor no no that's not the name the um, uh, Uh, da, 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 da. I was looking at, what is her name? Marjorie Townsend, uh, I believe. Um, I will have it in one second here. Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, there it is. The Marjorie Rhodes Townsend papers when I was sharing those. Um, so we've seen at least a little bit of it, but we'll look at it again, and there's plenty more. Uh, we will definitely have enough material to cover two hours of time. Uh, you'll be back in the lab next week, but hopefully can, can still stretch, stretch, catch the stream. He squared, it would be lovely to have you join us. Um, let me look and see who is streaming at the moment, uh, who we will want to raid over to. Uh, I'll give a hint, it's probably gonna be the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, if they are live, and they are, uh, and they are doing the shark cam today, and there seems to be quite a bit of activity on the shark cam today, so um, we're gonna head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Again, thank you all for coming. It has been um, a splendid time uh, getting this started for the year. It's been a lovely time uh, for the one year anniversary of this stream, and let me tell you, the chat was a lot more active. Uh, today than it was a year ago, um, and I definitely enjoy that. It has been um, a great year building this program, and I'm glad that you all come and enjoy it. Um, thank you again, 16-Bit Eric, for the raid, and uh, thank you to um, uh, Be Right UK, uh, and I am Puddle Glum for the bits, and uh, to uh, Soybot for the follow, on actually on both channels. Um, let me go ahead and set up the raid <laughs> and um, do, do, do on both channels. We will go to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yes. So um, like I said, come back, visit us again next Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time right here on either twitch.tv slash VTUL studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27 for more archival adventures. Also check out our additional programming on uh, VTUL Studios. There's, uh, I believe on Thursdays, we have a program um, where Jonathan is designing 3D environments. So if you have any interest in that, uh, go ahead and check that out. The schedule should be there on the, um, the about page for twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Until next week, I hope that you all have a wonderful week and I look forward to seeing you again. Bye.